Welcome to the Murder in 20 podcast, where I, Bobby Stevens, am your host with a new episode every Wednesday. If you're a serious fan of true crime and love listening to podcasts, but don't want all that small talk, you've come to the right place. We get right to the facts. Murder in 20 episodes are concise and complete in 20 minutes. Less talk and more true crime. Every episode is free on our website at murderin20.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and YouTube. Also learn about upcoming episodes on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. To support Murder in 20, feel free to leave a five-star review on any one of them, or all of them. We're not shy. And we couldn't do this podcast without all our sources, which we acknowledge throughout the podcast and are listed on our website. Thanks for tuning in. Now let's get to this week's episode. It was 1976 in Claremont, California, a college town 30 miles east of Los Angeles. Its quaint downtown features dress shops and toy stores. Nearby, there is hiking in the summer on Potato Mountain and skiing in the winter on the slopes of Mount Baldy. Kristen grew up with two younger brothers and were raised by their parents, who were both college professors. Her father was a Justice Department official in the Reagan administration. Kristen was a beautiful child who modeled. In high school, she looked like a beauty queen with a perky nose, thin frame, and long straight blonde hair. But she struggled with a drug addiction to methamphetamine. She managed to stop using the drug for a time, and in 1994 went to the University of Redlands, 30 miles away, and lived in a dorm. Court records indicated that she later left school without telling her parents and disappeared. In early 1995, she reappeared, a hundred miles south in Chula Vista, near the Mexican border. At 18, she found herself slipping back into familiar territory and had relapsed and was using meth and living in a motel room. At a border crossing nearby, she met Greg DeVille. The two quickly began dating, and she moved into his apartment. Greg was tall and good-looking, with dark hair, and was from a prominent family as well. His father was a well-known plastic surgeon. He helped her quit using meth and got her to go back to college. The couple became engaged in October 1996. She went to San Diego State University and graduated with honors with a degree in chemistry and became a toxicologist at the San Diego County Medical Examiner's Office, while Greg worked at a biotech company. After dating for five years, the couple tied the knot on June 5, 1999. ABC News reported that in their wedding video, they seemed like a happy couple, with Greg declaring, I just can't wait to spend the rest of my life with her. But marriage didn't go smoothly for the couple. The medical examiner's office had hired a new forensic laboratory manager, Michael Robertson. He was from Australia, good-looking and married. Kristen and Michael were drawn to each other. Perhaps the unhappiness in their marriages created a common bond. And soon began an affair. They didn't attempt to hide it. And some of her co-workers resented her for it and the possibility that she might receive special treatment from Michael, who was her supervisor. Meanwhile, Kristen had confided in her brother and a friend that she had tried to talk to Greg about a trial separation and was looking for her own apartment. As part of her job at the medical examiner's office, Kristen was in charge of the drug lockers and had access to drugs that had been logged in One of the drugs was fentanyl. It is 80 times more powerful than morphine and sometimes is prescribed for cancer patients. As a toxicologist, she knew exactly how the drug worked and how potent it was and discreetly removed the fentanyl from the locker. 
Kristen knew that autopsies at her office did not routinely test for fentanyl, and she had a plan. CBC News reported that Kristen claimed that within a year, Greg had become clingy, and that she responded by trying to exert her independence. In October 2000, she began smoking crystal meth again. Court records indicated that a month later, Greg confronted her about her drug use. She told Greg about her affair with Michael and that she wanted a trial separation. He responded by demanding she end the affair and threatened to report her drug use and the affair to her and Michael's supervisors at work. That weekend was her 17-month wedding anniversary, but they did not celebrate. Instead, tension filled the air in their apartment. On Monday, November 6th, Kristen awoke early. She filled a syringe with fentanyl, then pulled back the covers slightly and inserted the needle into the inside of Greg's left arm. He was immediately rendered unconscious. At 7.42 a.m., she called Greg's place of employment and left a voicemail that he wouldn't be into work that day. Then she left for work. Co-workers noticed that morning that she was crying in Michael's office. At 12.10, she went home on her lunch break and checked on Greg. His breathing had become labored with shallow breaths. She left him home alone and went to the grocery store and purchased cold medicine, soup, and a single rose. Then she returned to the office. At 2.30 p.m., she left work and stopped by their apartment to check on Greg. He was still breathing. She left and spent time with Michael. At 5 p.m., she returned to her apartment again and checked on Greg. He was still breathing. At 6.30 p.m., she left to run errands and returned to their apartment around 8 p.m. and had a shower. Greg's breathing had finally stopped. She touched him. His body was cold. Greg was dead at only 26. In a scene reminiscent of her favorite movie, American Beauty, where a young woman is showered in rose petals, Kristen plucked the petals from the rose she'd bought, one by one, and placed them on Greg's chest. She placed a photo from their wedding under his head and a love letter from Michael nearby. At 9.22 p.m., Kristen finally dialed 911. The operator directed her to move Greg's body to the floor and perform CPR. Paramedics arrived to find Greg on the floor, surrounded by rose petals. He was rushed to the hospital and pronounced dead at 10.19 p.m. Kristen told a nurse that he may have overdosed on oxycodone. Initially, Kristen was cooperative with police. She said that morning while she was getting ready for work, Greg was still in bed. Normally, he would have been up getting ready for work as well. She said that he appeared sluggish and his speech was slurred. She chalked it up to him taking something the night before and was still feeling its effects. At lunchtime, she went home and fed Greg soup, and he told her that he had taken Oxycontin, a painkiller, and clonazepam, a muscle relaxant, medication that had been prescribed to Kristen years earlier when she was trying to get off meth. She said that when she arrived home that night, Greg was asleep in bed and snoring. Later, she checked on him again, and that's when she found out he wasn't breathing. Two days later, Rust Lowe, an employee at the medical examiner's office, called police to tell them about Kristen and Michael's affair. This caught police's attention. They weren't aware of that. Now, was it suicide or foul play? 
That same day, the operations administrator at the medical examiner's office, the same office where Christian worked, made the call to not process the specimens taken from Greg and to avoid any conflict of interest, they would be sent to an outside lab. Each specimen sample was marked and put in a container, then in a cardboard box. A member from the Sheriff's Department was to take the box to an outside lab immediately after the autopsy. However, he was unable to attend, and the box of specimens was stored in a fridge at the medical examiner's office for 36 hours. Pacific Toxicology, the outside lab that tested Greg's specimen samples, discovered therapeutic levels of clonazepam and traces of oxycodone and a substantially high level of fentanyl. Although the medical examiner's office did not regularly test for fentanyl, Pacific Toxicology did. Greg's autopsy concluded that he died of acute fentanyl intoxication and that he would have slipped into a coma 12 hours before his death and had been dead at least an hour before paramedics arrived. Five needle marks were discovered on his body, four on his arms, and one in his groin. The three on his arms had been made by paramedics, and the groin was from the emergency room doctors who tried to save his life. There was one needle mark on his left arm that was unaccounted for. Greg's boss at the biotech company and his family and friends all knew that Greg would not commit suicide. He was not known to take any kind of drugs, even over-the-counter medications. They said that he was mentally strong and had been making plans for the future. Greg's brother Jerome encouraged police to question Kristen. And Greg's boss, who was highly suspicious, contacted police to ask that they reopen the case. Court records revealed that a month after fentanyl had been discovered in Greg's autopsy, the police asked the medical examiner's office to do an audit of their drug inventory. In checking the drug locker, they discovered two drugs were missing, methamphetamine and fentanyl. In total, 10 milligrams of liquid fentanyl was missing and 15 fentanyl patches. Records show that Kristen had logged in the liquid fentanyl and had worked on each of the cases where the patches were logged in. Investigators thought Kristen had likely used a needle to administer the fentanyl, but there was also the possibility that she could have applied fentanyl patches to his arms while he slept. Both Kristen and Michael were fired from their jobs, her for drug use and him for hiding their affair and his knowledge of her drug use. Kristen managed to find a new job for a short time at a biotech company. Michael fled to Australia. Prosecutors labeled Michael as an unindicted co-conspirator, and the case against him was kept open. On January 4, 2001, Kristen was arrested. It had been two months since Craig's death. Court records reported that when police searched her apartment, she told them that they would find meth and drug paraphernalia, and they did. Kristen's cell phone records revealed that she had made calls to her drug dealer in Mexico early on the morning of her husband's death, and that she had made cash withdrawals at an ATM that coincided with her phone calls. Kristen pled not guilty at her arraignment. She claimed adultery was her only crime and that she had not murdered her husband. Her parents stood by their daughter. Her father, Ralph, said that if she has an affair with her boss, if she uses drugs, these are examples of moral weakness, and that she had displayed bad judgment and weakness of character. And that is very different from committing murder. 
Kristen's parents mortgaged their home for her $1.25 million bail, but they did not have the money to hire a defense lawyer, and a public defender was assigned to her case. Now, remember when Kristen told police that she went home and fed Greg soup for lunch? Well, right before the trial began, investigators located that grocery receipt, and it turned out that she bought the soup after she visited Greg. Kristen's murder trial began in October 2002. She stood before a judge and a jury that contained five women and seven men. Cameras were banned from the courtroom, but the media followed her every move entering and exiting the courthouse. Always fashionably dressed, a serious expression on her face, and her hair pulled back. The defense claimed that Greg committed suicide and hid the evidence to make it look like murder. The prosecution rebutted, with experts stating that the injection would have knocked him out immediately. There would have been no chance for him to hide it, and that Kristen had poisoned him and staged it to look like a suicide. The defense pointed out that Greg had visited Kristen at the medical examiner's office numerous times and could have taken the fentanyl himself. They also brought up the 36 hours that the autopsy specimens had remained in the medical examiner's fridge. The lids had not been sealed, and all the toxicologists who worked there had a key and 24-hour access. For eight hours, Christian was grilled on the witness stand. It would later take the jury the exact same amount of time to reach a verdict. The LA Times reported that she was found guilty by special circumstances. That meant she was eligible for the death penalty. Christian burst into tears and shook her head. She looked at the jurors, but not one looked back at her. Then she looked over at her parents in disbelief. Kristen was handcuffed and barely able to walk, stumbled as bailiffs led her out of the courtroom. Prosecutors chose instead to seek a life term, and a month later she was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole. In November 2006, Authorities very quietly filed a felony conspiracy complaint against Michael. He was still living in Australia, now with a new wife. If he ever returns to the United States, he could be arrested and held on a $100,000 bail. Over the years, Christian filed many appeals and all were denied. She is serving her time behind bars at the Central California Women's Facility in Chowchilla. Thanks for listening to Murder in 20 with less talk and more true crime. Be sure to tune in next Wednesday for the episode of Amanda Zhao. As a young woman, she moved to Canada for a better future. Her dreams ended when the person she trusted strangled her, crammed her body into a suitcase, and threw her into the lake, then fled to China. Ten years later, justice tracked him down. If you're dying to hear more, past episodes of Murder in 20 are available for free at murderin20.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and YouTube. And every week, we announce upcoming episodes on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Until then, stay safe, sleep with the lights on, and don't play with strangers.